2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 14 through 17 we stand today in honor of the reading of God's word and the King James text today reads but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul is writing to a young man he has known since his earliest youth, a man named Timothy. Timothy is sort of a spiritual son to Paul. Timothy has been well brought up. He has godly parents. He knows the Word of God. He knows the Scriptures. As I've explained many times before, any time in the New Testament you read the word Scriptures, it is referring to the Old Testament canon of, of texts. It does not refer to Matthew through Revelation. At the writing of this epistle, most in the church world at that time, in the first century, would be blessed if they had had access to even one of the Gospels. They did not have Genesis through Revelation. They did not have Matthew through Revelation. What they had primarily at that time in the early life of the church was the Scriptures, meaning the Old Testament. And Paul said to Timothy, you've known the Holy Scriptures. Well, obviously he's talking about the Old Testament, Johnny, because the New Testament didn't exist yet. So how could he possibly have known the New Testament? He couldn't. But Paul goes plain concerning the Scriptures that the Old Testament Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Old Testament was not written by men's imaginations. It was not written uh, merely by the working of human minds, but the Spirit of God touched the minds and hearts of men and worked with them and through them to create that canon of Scripture that we have today. Uh, Genesis, the book of Genesis, written by Moses all the way through the minor prophet Malachi. But Paul said all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, meaning that this is what the scriptures can produce in our lives, is profitable for doctrine, meaning sound teaching, sound teaching. For reproof, Ooh, reproof. We don't like the notion of reproof. For correction. Correction means sometimes you're wrong. And the way to know you're wrong is to be corrected. Well, the way to be corrected is to be instructed by the scriptures. And he said, for instruction in righteousness. The scriptures will help to instruct you in how to act right and live right and do right. That the man of God, listen, may be perfect. Wow, perfect. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Perfection is not defined as without faults or without weaknesses, or even without sin. That is not what perfection refers to. Uh, 
but rather the term perfection that we read here taken from a Greek word that translates mature and complete. Many Christians today want to believe that they are complete, that they are fully matured, and that they have in fact attained perfection. They rail against the slightest suggestion that they are somehow missing the mark. They want praise and recognition for that which they do, but they uh, want their shortcomings to be ignored or overlooked. I've had people in this church, Johnny, who have left and stopped coming because even though the pastor has on many, many, many occasions acknowledged areas where they did right and they did the, the right thing and they helped and, you know, they were, as a child of God, they were doing what they ought to be doing. I had the gall to suggest that there was something they could be doing that they weren't. And oh, that just ticked them off. You know why it ticked them off? Because they had it in their head that they had already arrived at perfection. You see, you don't have to mature. You don't have to grow. You don't have to become complete if you're already complete. You don't need to grow up if you've already grown up and you become a big man in the faith. If you become, oh, I'm a big man, bless God. I've had people in this very church who have had it in their mind, and they still have it in their mind today, that they're just perfect in time the way they are. And God help us if the pastor dares to preach a message that challenges us to step up a little higher, to do a little better, to get a little more mature, to become a little more complete in our walk with God. God help us if the pastor does that. Because a lot of Christians in the church today, they're not interested. They want to feel like they have arrived. And God help you if you suggest that they've done anything but arrive. I've had people in this church who came from Pentecostal background. And I'm going to tell you, when you come from Pentecostal background, and you've got to work like ours, and it is a difficult work, it is a strenuous work, the pastor needs people who understand how this thing works. I need people who know how to walk the walk and talk the talk. We need people who know how to be an example unto the believers because a lot of folks as you know who come into this fellowship are not from Pentecostal background they don't understand necessarily apostolic worship and apostolic ways and I've had people come into this church who came from apostolic background and Pentecostal background and dare I say to them you could be a greater help than you are. I'm not saying you're not a help at all. I'm not saying you're not a blessing at all. I'm not saying you don't do a lot of things right. But there are some other areas that would really be helpful and beneficial if you'd step up and do these things so that the other believers and the other saints could benefit from the example. Do you follow what I'm saying? And oh, I've had people get just ticked off at me. Why, well, how dare he? How dare he suggest for one minute that I'm not 100% complete, that I'm not doing 100%. I've had folks in this very church, every person they ever invited to this church, every single person they ever invited to this church did not stay. Every single person they invited wound up falling off and not coming to church and not being part of our church. Now, Martin's been coming a couple of years now. Every person Martin's brought has stayed with us. Isn't that funny? But we've had other people, some who are from apostolic Pentecostal background. Every person they invited to this church, they'd come for a few weeks, all of a sudden they'd drop off. 
And this person would say to me, well, you know, I was talking with this person that I brought to church and that person that I had invited to church, and they couldn't understand why you were saying thus and so, you know, because it sounded like you were trying to say that I needed to step up and, and do something. And, and they couldn't understand it because they felt like I was just doing wonderful and I was doing, well, that's all well and good. How many in this room been in the military? Well, I know Bill has. I know Brother Jack was. You know what's funny about the military? Know how to tie your shoes. Know how to wear your uniform. Know how to march in, in order the way you're supposed to march. Know how to follow the orders. When they say, you know, right, hut, left, hut, you know, know how to turn in the correct direction. Do all that right, but don't make your cock right in the morning. And what's going to happen, Bill? Is that sergeant going to say? Is that drill sergeant going to say, well, bless God, you do everything else right, so that's okay. I don't mind that your bed ain't made right. Am I telling the truth today? No. That drill sergeant is going to get on you and say, son, you need to make this bed right. Get on it. Get I want to be able to bounce a quarter on that thing. Am I telling the truth? You see... You're not a complete soldier. You're not a mature soldier. You haven't fully arrived. That's not to say you don't do all kinds of things well. That's not to say you don't know, Bill, how to do all kinds of stuff the military wants you to do. But it is expected that you be a complete soldier and that you do everything. Thing. Am I telling the truth? According to their standard. We come to church and bless God. We just want the pastor to preach us happy and tell us what a great job we do and how wonderful we march and how we're able to turn left when we're told to turn left and we turn right when we're told to turn right. But don't let that pastor tell me that I don't make my cop right. Bless God, I'll tell you what. I'll just get mad and I'll go to church somewhere else. I'll just get mad and I won't bother coming to church. Because I don't want anybody telling me that I'm not mature. Well, I got news for you. You're not. Part of being mature, listen to me now, part of growing up is being able to take Reproof and correction and instruction. I remember you remember what you remember what Paul said. He said, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, right? Well, part of being a perfect man, part of being a complete child of God and being a mature child of God. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. There are a lot of people in the church, Tommy, who still think like babies. Don't take that rattle away from them because they're going to have a crying, screaming fit. Don't say something that they don't like because they're going to take their ball and go home and you'll never see them in church again. You know, the funny thing about the Christian church, people in the church are okay with the fact that they're imperfect, but don't let the pastor be. Oh, I can live with my imperfections. I can live with the fact that I'm not 100% everything I ought to be. I can live with the fact that I'm satisfied with being 70% or 60% or 50% and then there are some who are 20% and 10% of the Christian they ought to be. I don't want to be challenged. I don't want the pastor to reprove me. I don't want the pastor to correct me. God help. No, don't he better not. Part of being mature is being able to take Reproof is being able to take correction. 
is being able to take instruction. When I served my internship in the Church of God many years ago, uh, what the pastor that I served my internship under at the time was much, much, much more, you might say, liberal than I was, believe it or not. I was much more conservative. Back then, I was, you know, high hair and long sleeves and real strict Pentecostal believing. And uh, he and I were at odds on a lot of things, a lot of issues we did not agree on. But Brother Carver said to me one day, he said, Chuck, i got to tell you something, son. He was pro I was... 18, 19 years old, he was, this is just before I started my first church at 19. He was in his 50s. He since has gone home to be with the Lord. Good man. And Brother Carver said to me, he said, I, I've got to tell you something, son. He said, as much as I know you and I disagree on any number of issues, he said, I will say one thing for you. You are teachable. He said, you never come at me with the attitude of you know it all and you've got it all and I can't tell you nothing and I can't teach you nothing. Just because we disagree on some things, you don't just sign me off and act like I haven't got nothing to say and I, I can't tell you nothing. He said, you are instructable, you're teachable. If I ask you to do something and I lay out how I want you to do it, you do it exactly the way I've asked you to do it. Now, Bill, when you were in the military, isn't that the way it was? Yeah, right. If they told you to peel potatoes a certain way, if they told you to use a paring knife, you used a paring knife. You didn't use a potato peeler. It don't matter if a potato peeler would work faster and better. If that sergeant or whoever it was told you to use a paring knife, you used a paring knife. I've had people doing ministries on behalf of our church. Supposed to be on behalf of our church. And I've tried to instruct them, Johnny. I said, listen, here's how you do this, okay? This is how I need you to do this. When you go into a nursing home and you do a nursing home service, okay? Here's how nursing home ministry is to be done. You take no longer than 45 minutes, period. Okay? You lead the people in a couple of hymns, a couple of songs. Then you deliver a little word of exhortation. The word of exhortation should be encouraging, uplifting, inspiring. It shouldn't be too heavy in terms of doctrine and what have you for several reasons. Number one, a lot of these people, their minds are not in a place to digest, you know, real heavy subject matter. Number two, uh, these folks, a lot of them are old. They have incontinence issues. They, you know, they have uh, issues. The employees are working on a schedule. They have to get certain numbers of things done. How many have ever worked in a nursing home in this room? I have. Well, I'll tell you, every day, every day, those employees have a schedule. There's a time that is allotted where you have to bathe the patients, where you have to shave the patients and get them ready for bed and get them ready for loved ones to come visit them. And, you know, there's this, everything's on a schedule. So I've explained to people who did nursing home ministry, listen, this is how you must do this, okay? You're going to have people in that nursing home service who are Baptists. You're going to have people in that nursing home service who are Methodists. You're going to have people in that nursing home service who are Lutheran, who are Catholic, who are whatever. Your job is not to go in there and straighten them out in terms of their belief system, in terms of what they specifically believe. That is not your job. You're going in a lot like someone who is working as a chaplain. And as a chaplain, you're ministering to a variety of different backgrounds in a variety of different traditions. Am I telling the truth? You're ministering to a variety of different traditions and all. So you've got to keep your message light. You've got to keep it, I guess you might say, sort of generalized, you know. But you want to encourage the people. You want to... Listen, if God wants them to understand Jesus' name baptism, I promise you, if there's, if there's any interest in them at all, 
in deeper knowledge and deeper understanding of the truth of God, he'll open the door for you to talk to them and for you to minister that to them. You may do it one-on-one -on -one in their room, completely apart from the nursing home service. Do you follow what I'm saying? And I've tried, Tommy, you know I've done this. I've tried to explain all this to people, right? And what happens? Bill, uh, Johnny, they go in there and they do that service any old way they want to do that service. Next thing you know, they're there for two hours. Oh, but the people were just eating up everything I was saying. Because after all, I'm right up there with Billy Graham, you know. And boy, I mean to tell you, everybody there was just eating up every word I was saying. Uh, yeah, that's all well and good, but you know what? When I went back to do the services again for a while, the employees were coming to me, and they were mad as a hornet because you were messing up their schedule. They didn't have time to do what they needed to do with those pay. Do you follow what I'm saying? You see, Bill, I knew why I was instructing that person to do things a certain way. But they didn't have time to receive my instruction. They weren't interested in listening to what I was trying to tell them and doing things as I had instructed them to do things. Do you follow what I'm saying? Part of being a child of God, part of growing up, part of maturing in the faith is being able to take instruction. Oh, but you know what? If you're somebody in the church who doesn't take instruction well, it just ticks you off that the pastor has the nerve to say that you don't take instruction well. I remember when I was a young man, I had a pastor, the same man who baptized me in Jesus' name, in fact, and he once told me, and, and I'm going to say this in front of y'all, he looked at me one time and he said, you know, he said, you think you hear from God a lot. He said, but brother, I'm going to tell you right now, you ain't hearing from God half as often as you think you are. Boy, he could have hit me with a frying pan. You think I wanted him to tell me that what I thought was God speaking to me half the time wasn't God speaking to me? Do you think I wanted to hear him say that? No, I didn't want to hear him say that. But you know what? I didn't get mad at him. I didn't leave the church over it. I didn't run off and get kicked off and brother brought because he had the nerve to say no. He was my pastor. God put him in that position. God put me in that church. I'm going to receive instruction. So you know what I did? I went home and I began to pray. I said, Lord, you need to help me to, to weed out when you're speaking to me and when my own brain is talking to me. And to this day, I am, Tommy can tell you, because I'll say to him, I'll say, sometimes I'll say, well, you know, I worry sometimes that what I think is the Lord telling me something is just my own fear or my own, you know, anxiety. Or, Don't I? Haven't I said that to you? You see, all because of what Brother Brock said to me. He didn't hurt me one bit. No, he helped me. What he did is he made me more cautious. He made me a little slower when it comes to saying, well, God told me this and God told me that. He slowed me down. He made me, and this is why, even in prophetic ministry, this is why, and I, again, Tommy and I, we've been together 17 years, so we've had quite a few conversations. And I've told him, I said, you know, even when it comes to prophetic words, the Lord will speak to me about something prophetically, right? I will hold on to that like a bear trap. I will keep my mouth shut. I will not say one word to the church. I will not preach it. I will not say a word about it. Because I am weighing it out and I'm testing it so that by the time I speak it to the church, I can have every confidence, Johnny, that I'm hearing from God. Because I don't want to speak out of turn. Amen. Haven't I used that exact phrase, Tommy, with you many times? I've said, I don't want to speak out of turn. I don't want to say that God spoke to me and showed me something until I know that 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 I know. Now listen, there are many times God speaks to me and shows me something. And Johnny, I know that I know that I know the minute he speaks to me. I know that God has told me this. I still keep my mouth shut. 
And I still pray about it. I still meditate on it. I still talk to the Lord about it. Until I am absolutely certain. Because not everything God tells you today, he wants you to speak today. Hello now. Just because just cause somebody tells you something, how many times has somebody come to you and said, listen, don't say anything but. Don't say anything to Dina, but we brought a birthday cake for her today, and after work we're going to surprise her, and we're going to, you know what I'm saying? And now they're giving you information that you need to know, but they don't want you out there blabbing it. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I got news for you. There are many times God will speak to a preacher, to a pastor, to a prophet, and he'll say, listen, you need to know this. And he'll tell you, that doesn't mean he wants you to go out in front of the church and spill your beans and tell everybody everything. Because while you're able to handle that information at the moment, doesn't mean everybody else is. Do you follow what I'm saying? So you've got to be careful. But you know, it frustrates me to no end that God has given us his word. He's given us the ministry, people in ministry, pastors, evangelists, teachers, and they are there to profit us, to benefit us, so that we can aspire to perfection. So that we can pursue perfection. That doesn't mean, you know, again, that doesn't mean you're not going to have a burr here and there. Doesn't mean you're not going to have, you know, a hangnail. But we ought to be in pursuit of growth. See, you can never, as a child of God, until you look like Jesus and can walk on water, you should never think for a moment you don't have room to grow. Amen. That's right. The biggest problem that we have had in the church, and I don't mean just affirming, I mean, I've been pastoring a lot of years, 35 plus years. The biggest problem that the church has ever had is people who are so full of pride, and the enemy loves to sow pride into your spirit, that are so full of pride that they're convinced there's no room for growth. I was born and raised in the church. I've been in this thing. I've had the Holy Ghost since I was a kid. I've been pastoring for many years, and i got news for you. I'm not stupid enough to think that I've got it all down and that I'm perfect and that I've got everything. I know everything there is to know. My little brother said to my mother recently, and it tickles me. I'm, I'm happy to hear this. He told my mother, he said, well, I'm so glad Chuck has changed and he's come around to believe the way he believes and that he has the, the, the understanding that he has now about certain issues. <clears throat> he said, because I'm so happy to be back in contact with him and to, for us to have a relationship again, to be back, you know. And you see, Johnny, years ago, I had a very different way of looking at things. I had a very different understanding. I had a very different uh, outlook. But I've changed. But I've grown. But I realized at some point in my journey with God that there were things I believed and thought that were wrong. I needed correction. Hello now. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I needed correction. I needed to be corrected. And thank God I was listening to the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost was able to correct me and help me get off of a wrong path and get onto a right path. Do you follow what I'm saying? If I wasn't open to growth, if I wasn't open to maturing, if I wasn't open to becoming more complete as a child of God and as a minister of the gospel, I would still think and believe the way I did 30 years ago, but I don't. Do you follow what I'm saying today? I'm going to tell you something. Most people go to church not so they can grow, not so they can mature, not so they can pursue holiness and perfection, but rather so they can 
sit and listen to the pastor cheerlead and tell them how wonderful they are and how perfect they are. And one of the ways that the fundamentalists and the evangelicals love to do this is by putting the other guy down. Because the more they put the other guy down, they make you think that you're much better than the other guy. <coughs> So they elevate you by convincing you that that guy over there, that queer over there, or that person over there is worse than you are. Hallelujah. At least you're better than they are. You want to understand the concept of perfection? Look at the story of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus. He said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The Lord looked at him and said, well, you know, keep the law. And the rich young ruler said, oh, I've been doing that since I was a kid. Oh, I don't steal. I don't lie. I don't cheat anybody. I don't commit adultery. I don't. And he went down this list, you know, and said, oh, I've done all that. The Lord, the Lord went down the list. But the young man said, oh, I've done all that. You know, I've been keeping that since I was a kid. And then what did Jesus say? He said, if thou wouldst be perfect. Hmm. Interesting. He didn't say if you would inherit the kingdom of God. He said, if thou would be perfect. In other words, you still got room for growth. You've still got room. You're not complete. Yeah, you've done a lot of right things, but there's still room. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? He said, if you would be perfect, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And the Bible said the rich young ruler went away sorrowfully. Why? Because he had much. See, I'm going to tell you a little secret about that story. There are some things about that story that we don't read in the Word of God. The Lord was telling that young man... If you would be perfect, if you'd be complete, if you'd be mature, if you have a desire to be mature, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. That's if you want to be mature. Well, what do you mean, Lord? Well, what I mean is, if you understood the ways of God fully and completely, listen to me now, you'd understand that you can't outgive God. You'd understand that if you give, the word of God promises, it shall be given unto you. Hello now. You'd understand enough. You would have enough of a mindset, a mature mindset in God to know that you could sell every single thing you have and give it to the poor. And probably a year from now, you'll be richer than you were today. But that rich young ruler was not mature. That rich young ruler was not complete. That rich young ruler was not at a place in his thinking where he could be defined as perfect. Because he looked at what he had, not at what he could have. He looked at, oh, I, I can't do that, Lord, because I've got much. I've got a lot of stuff. There are times that Tommy, he can tell you, He'll look at me, and he'll just give me that raised eyebrow like he just did a second ago when I mentioned his name. He'll give me that raised eyebrow because I'm about to give again. I'm about to do something for somebody again. I'm about to whip out the old credit card and try to help somebody again. And he'll give me that raised eyebrow like, I know what you're doing. I know what you're up to. But you know what? I'm mature enough in the faith to understand that you cannot outgive God. You can try it all you want to. You're never going to be. God don't owe nobody nothing. The promises of God's word are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. They're as good as done. It says, give, and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. So, Johnny, I'm not afraid of giving. Not by a long stretch, am I, Booby? No. 
given is second nature to me. That's why, you know, I don't, I'm not one of them preachers gets up in the pulpit and says, oh, give, give, give to me. Give to us. Give to us. Give to us. No, I live a lifestyle of giving. Giving is second nature to me. If I have any way in the world of helping somebody in their circumstance, I'm going to do it. If I don't have money to give, I'll give my time. If I don't have time, I'll give my energy. Do you follow what I'm saying? I've helped many people move, and if there's anything in the world I hate to do, it's move. I remember when I was in Brother Brock's church years ago in Connecticut, there was a lady named Gloria. And she had more cats than Carter has liver pills. And I mean, God bless her heart, you know, a lot of her furniture kind of smelled and the rugs kind of smelled. You know how it is when you got 800,422,312 cats. And half of them are whizzing on the floor, you know. And one day at Bible study, whatever it was, Brother Brock mentioned that this lady was going to be moving. And he said... If you're able, if anybody would be willing to volunteer to help her move. And I remember thinking to myself, I was sitting there and I was thinking, number one, I've been in her house. I know what that stuff smells. I know, you know, I know what all that is. She lives on the third floor of a walk-up building. He said, if anybody a volunteer says she's got to move on such and such a day, and if I could have any volunteers to help us move, and there's my hand straight up in the air. And Johnny, I'm saying, what are you doing, you stew not? What are you doing? You know what that stuff smells like. You know you hate moving. You know you ain't trying to climb all them stairs. But there I was. You follow what I'm saying? That's part of giving, folks. That's, that's part of being a giver. It's not just about giving your money. It's not just about giving uh, even your time. But giving your energy. You know, giving your muscle power. Giving your manpower. I'll do whatever I can. My, I was dating somebody for two years. I was with somebody. And their mother was wanting to move. And she was going to move from New York, Queens, to a, a place in New Jersey. And she needed the biggest moving truck that U-Haul had. Biggest one. Well, back in those days... Uh, the biggest truck U-Haul had was only available in a uh, manual transmission. Every other truck they had, you could get in an automatic. But the biggest truck they had, they only offered them with a uh, manual transmission. Well, sh her boyfriend didn't know how to drive a manual, especially a truck. Uh, none of her sons knew how to drive a manual. Nobody around her knew how to drive a manual. I said, M M uh, Madge, I know how to drive a manual. That, I know how to drive a truck. I've driven school buses that were manual. You know, I've driven all. I said, I can do it for you. Oh, could you? I said, yes, ma'am, I sure can. She said, oh, thank you. I'll let you know when I'm planning on moving, when I'm actually going to make the move. Well, Patrick and I went down to Pennsylvania and picked up a bunch of stuff I had in storage, rented a U-Haul, drove it back to New York, put it in our apartment, which was the second floor walk-up. And we did that like on a Wednesday and Thursday, and Madge called us on Friday and said, I'm moving tomorrow. We were wiped out. You know, we had just moved a whole bunch of stuff out of Pennsylvania, brought it up, you know, eight-hour drive to New York City, to our apartment in Brooklyn, and we were wiped out. And I remember his, him talking to his mother on the phone, and he said, Mom, uh, we can't help you Saturday. There's no way. He said, I'm exhausted. Charles is exhausted. We just got through uh, moving all this stuff, you know. His stuff was in storage. And, blah, blah, blah. and, <clears throat> and I heard him, and I said, Patrick, what are you doing? No, no, don't tell her that. I said, I promised her I would help her move. I promised her I would drive that moving truck. I said, now, if I promised her, then I'm going to do it. Tell her I'll be there. Saturday morning come, Johnny, I'm, t I'm telling you, I was so worn out. My God, that move that we had done was, I mean, we moved a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. 
carrying it up, you know, a flight of stairs and all that. So I, she needed me to drive the truck. Now she had sons and she had a boyfriend and all who could help move this stuff, but they just couldn't drive the truck. So I drove the truck. Well, don't you know she wanted to go? I'm not kidding. She had a whole itinerary laid out. First, we were going to load up stuff at, at her apartment over here. Then we were going to go to this furniture store where she bought this. Then we were going to go to this store where she bought that. Then we were going to go. I drove that truck. I'm not kidding. All over New York City. She had bought furniture and different things at all these different locations. And I'm driving from one location to the next location to the and I mean New York City streets, folks, you know, driving a huge 26-foot U-Haul manual transmission, right? I'm exhausted out of my mind. And I drove that truck all over New York, finally drive her down to her new apartment in New Jersey. And I parked, I backed the truck up to the elevator, you know, the, the uh, what do you call it, elevator that they're able to bring furniture up on stuff. I carried a couple things up to her apartment. By then, I was so worn out, I couldn't see straight. I laid down in one of the bedrooms where she had had carpeting installed. I just laid down on the carpet and fell asleep. And her boyfriend and her and her boys were able to finish moving the stuff out of the truck. But I kept my word. I did what she needed me to do. I drove that truck. Do you follow what I'm telling you? And when they were all done emptying it, I drove it back and delivered it to U-Haul. And then, then I'm living in New York City at the time. I don't have a car. So then I've got to get on a subway and i got to ride for two hours to get back to the house. Before I can even get back to the house, it's going to be two hours of riding on subways, okay? Because she's all the way up, the U-Haul is all the way up in Queens, and, you know. I mean, I'm telling you, it was a lot to do. But folks, giving is not about just giving money. Giving is about your time. It's about your energy. It's about your manpower. And I, by nature, am a giver. That's something that... Uh, I believe in. Why do I believe in it the way I believe in it? Because spiritually I'm at that place in my understanding and in my maturity. Because I will tell you, there's a lot of these people out there in the world today who gripe and groan about churches asking for money and needing help and pastors asking for support. A lot of the same people who are griping and groaning about preachers asking for support and help. Bill, those people have no idea that spiritually they are immature. They are as immature as a three-year-old. Spiritually, they are immature. Because if they were more mature in the faith, they would understand. First of all, they'd understand, well, this is a necessity. This is just, they have to ask because they have to pay bills. They have to do things. And then secondly, they'd understand, you can't outgive God. They'd also be mature enough to understand, if you don't have anything to give, then so be it. You know, I don't get mad because somebody asks for help if I can't help them. I don't get upset. Well, they've got, I don't know what they're asking for help for just because I don't have something I can help them with. No, I say, well, I wish I could help them, but I can't. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's part of just being mature. That's part of being grown. There's another thing about being mature and being perfect as a child of God. The Word of God teaches that if your brother offends you, you should go to them. That's right. Don't quit going to church because the pastor said something on his Facebook that you didn't want to hear or you didn't like. That's crazy. No. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people, especially Johnny, I'm telling you, the LGBT community got so many drama queens, it's enough to make me crazy. I swear, I've never seen so much drama in my life. When I was in the mainstream church world, I didn't have people quit church over every little word I said and every little thing, you know. It, it wasn't like it is when you're trying to do an LGBT work. No, people in the LGBT community wear their feelings on their shirt sleeves. They get offended at the drop of a hat. And they'll drop a hat just so they can say they've been offended. And I get so tired of it. It's so crazy. But what people don't understand is if they would be mature, 
as the child of God, if they'd be perfect, if they would do everything that God wanted them to do, then if you get offended by something, you're supposed to go to that person and talk to them about it. And do you know if people would come and talk to me a lot of times about stuff that they got offended over, there's a good probability that I would do everything in my power not to do that again. Why? Because Paul taught. If your brother's offended by your eating meat, then don't eat meat in front of them. Because you don't want to offend them. You don't want to hurt their feelings. So if somebody came to me, uh, Booby, and said, you talk about the, the wall too much on your Facebook page. And to be honest, I, I just, as a man of God, it bothers me that you keep talking about Trump's wall. Well, you know what? It ain't going to kill me to not talk about the wall so much. Do you follow what I'm saying? And if it offends you that badly that you're not going to come to church and you're not going to be part of our church, then guess what? I can quit talking about the wall. It ain't that big a deal to me. Do you follow what I'm saying? But if they don't come and tell me and I never know, then how in the world am I supposed to do anything about it? We had two beautiful black ladies that came to our church some years back. It's been quite a few years ago now. We've been here, heavens, going on 17 years in Dallas, come Easter Sunday. But these two black women, nice ladies, they were coming for a few months. And Tommy and I loved them to death, and they seemed to love us, and everything was going along beautiful. Everything was going along fine. Then I did a Bible study, a teaching on biblical giving. Now, here's the funny thing. These ladies tithed. So it's not like they would be offended that I'm talking about biblical giving because they are. They're doing it. You know, so it's not like they... Well, after one Bible study one night, they left and we never saw them again. They never come back to church. And I, for the life of me, Tommy will tell you, when people quit coming to church out of the clear blue sky, I racked my brain to try to figure out if I offended them or if I said something or if I did something that might have, don't I? I mean, you have no idea, folks. You know, I don't think of myself as being perfect. I don't think of myself as being above, you know, uh, reproach. I, I know there are times I can say things out of turn or I can, you know, do something maybe a way I shouldn't have done it or said something the way I shouldn't have said it. And I racked my brain to find out why these ladies. So the Bible also teaches that if you have offended someone and you know you've offended them, that you ought then to go to them. So if you know you've offended somebody, then you should be mature enough and complete enough and grown enough to go to them. Now, it's not easy to do that. A lot of times it's not easy to swallow your pride and go to somebody that you know you've offended, okay? But if you're going to be a child of God and if you're going to grow up and be a man and, and be a woman of faith and you're going to live this thing the way you're meant to live it, then you're going to go to them. If somebody's offended you, then you should be grown up enough to go to them and talk to them about it. See, God wants us as people of God to communicate. He wants us as people of God to work through our issues and our problems. He doesn't want us to run off and avoid confrontation and avoid discussing and communicating over issues, okay? No, that's how the world acts. That's not how the church is supposed to act. Well, those ladies, Bill, should have come to me. And they should have told me what the problem was, but they didn't. So I assumed that I had offended them in some way, and I wrote her an email or whatever, and I said, listen, you know, uh, all of a sudden, y'all quit coming to church. We haven't heard from you. I said, did I offend you in some way? Is there something I said or did that offended you? Because we sure have missed you. And all of a sudden, I get an email back. Please take our names off of your email list. Again, Tommy can tell you, I went for months and months and months in turmoil trying to figure out what I might have said or what I did that offended these women. Didn't I? Yep. I was constantly obsessing over it because 
I had no closure. I had no idea what the problem was. They weren't grown enough in the faith to come talk to me and tell me what their problem was. I went to them and I opened. I gave them the opportunity to tell me, and they still slammed the door in my face. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? See, being complete and being perfect, which is what the Word of God has given to us in order to help us achieve, growing up and becoming mature in the faith is not altogether always an easy process. There are a lot of things, Johnny, you learn to do as an adult that as a kid you couldn't do. Right. You know, as a kid you were afraid of confrontation. As a kid you were afraid of rejection, you know. Now as a grown man, uh, I'm not nearly as afraid of rejection as I was when I was a teenager. Of course, now I got somebody, but when I was dating and all that, hey, you know what, I'd go to the prettiest person in the room and say, hi, you're a doll. You know, would you like to go out sometime? And if they looked at me and said, you ugly old scumbag, no, why, why would you think I'd want to go out with you? I'd say, oh, well, you know, and I'd move along. Didn't bother me no kind of way. But when you're a teenager, Bill, and you hadn't grown up and learned that words, rejection, you know, it don't amount to a hill of beans. Somebody rejecting you don't amount to a hill of beans. For every person that rejects you, there's 20 of them that would be happy to go out with you. Am I telling the truth? See, there's a lot of things that as immature people, we have a hard time with. But as you mature, those same things become second nature. Those same things become much easier. As Christians, there are things that are difficult for us when we're still young in the faith. But as we grow and as we mature, we ought to be able to do those things easily. We ought to be able to go to somebody who's offended us and talk to them about it. We ought to be able to go to somebody that we know we have offended and talk to them about uh, whatever way we have offended them. But no, we have people in the church who they don't want to be told that there's an area of their life where they yet could use some tweaking. They yet could use some growth. They yet could use some maturity. But listen, I want to use the book of Revelation real quick. I want to use the book of Revelation to illustrate my point. Listen to how God approaches things. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the Lord is speaking through John the Revelator to the church at Ephesus. And listen to what he says. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them, which are evil. And thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience. And for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. My goodness, the Lord sure is singing their praises in thee. Verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. What am I saying? I'm saying this, Johnny. Just because you do all kinds of right doesn't mean you're not still missing something somewhere else. So get over yourself. There's still room for growth. If thou wouldst be perfect, there's still something. You know, again, I've had people leave this church because God helped. The pastor actually suggested that they could have done something else that would have been helpful and, you know, that, that would have been right when they wanted to believe they were doing everything right from the get-go and they weren't missing anything. Well, the Lord himself says to the church at Ephesus, nevertheless, for you've done all this right, nevertheless, 
I have someone against thee. Now, Revelation 2, 13 through 15. He writes uh, through John the Revelator to the church at Pergamos. Listen, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Well, the Lord just singing their praises. Verse 14. But I have a few things against thee. Are you following me? This is Jesus talking to the churches, folks. But I have a few things against thee. If you'd be the perfect man, if you still, there's still room for growth. There's still room. You're not fully complete. I have a few things against it. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So the Lord, he gives them credit for all the things to do right. But then he says, but, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Revelation 3, verses 1 through 3, John, uh, John the Revelator writes the Lord's words to Sardis, the church at Sardis. And under the angel of the church in Sardis, right? These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art, and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Listen, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Well, the pastor's not supposed to tell me I'm not perfect. The pastor's not supposed to tell me that I'm not doing everything just exactly right. The pastor's not supposed to get up and preach sermons that challenge me to grow up. That challenges me to be better and do better and do more than I'm doing. Hello now, am I, do you follow what I'm trying to tell you today? This is an important message, folks, because this is what's killing the church today in America. We got a bunch of people act like a bunch of stupid two-year-olds calling themselves Christians, and they are so immature in the faith. They are so incomplete. They are so far from being what God wants his church to be, and they are representing Christianity in a horrible, terrible way. And the only way we can counterbalance and counteract all the negativity that they're bringing upon the church today is if we do it right. If we learn to humble ourselves before the Lord. If we learn to let God perfect himself in us. If we grow up. Revelation 3, 14 and 16 through 16. John writes to the church at Laodicea, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot, excuse me, cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot, so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Oh, my goodness. He, he didn't even have any praise to heap upon these people. He just let them know, y'all are falling short of what I want you to be. The enemy would love to convince us today that we've already arrived. It is this false notion that gives birth in many believers to self-righteousness, judgmentalness, and a critical nature. There is nothing more destructive in the life of a child of God than the false sense of self-satisfaction that pride delivers. And we know what the Word of God says about pride, don't we? 
Proverbs 16, 18, and 19. Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi in Philippians 3, 8 through 15, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now listen, verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. My goodness, Paul had enough humility in him. Paul, of all the Christians in the throughout the history of the church, Paul says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, I pursue, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He said, I do not consider myself as having arrived. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, listen, as many as be perfect, as many as be mature, as many as be complete, be thus minded, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. One of the greatest figures in the history of the Christian church was the Apostle Paul. And Paul had enough humility in him to know, <laughs> I make no claims of having arrived. But we've got churches full of people today who feel like they've arrived. We've got churches full of believers today who want to believe that they, man, they're at the apex of their faith, that they're living everything that they ought to be living, that they've accomplished everything they ought to accomplish, that they are everything they're supposed to be. And that's why they get ticked off at the preacher when the preacher comes along and says, like Jesus to the rich young ruler, uh, but if you would be perfect, there's still something you can do. There's still something... Yeah, you pray good, but I really need you to step up and worship. Yeah, you worship good, but I really need you to step up in prayer. Yeah, you know, you're faithful to church. You come to church, you tithe, but you don't take instruction. When I try to instruct you on how to do something, you ignore every word I've said, and you do it any old way you want to do it. Do you follow what I'm trying to tell you today? We hadn't arrived, but we're headed that way. Lastly today, and I'm closing with this, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 57, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, 
For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We haven't arrived and will never arrive until Jesus comes. Amen. Until we cross that finish line and we're changed, we're never going to be everything that we ought to be. So you can't get offended if the preacher gets up and encourages you to do a little more, to give a little more, to be a little more, to grow up, to have a better attitude, to have a better mindset, to understand things a little more maturely. We can't get upset over that. My God, that's his job. If you think you've arrived, then honey, I've got news for you. You've got a very, very bad mindset. And it's going to destroy you. But if you understand, and I promise you, this preacher understands, that I am far from perfect. I can't even see perfect, uh, Bill, from where I live, okay? And I know that. That's why every day of my life, I'm pursuing holiness. The Bible said, follow after peace with all men and holiness. So you're following after two things. You're pursuing two things. Peace with all men and holiness. You will never possess holiness. People in the Pentecostal church who run around saying, well, because I dress this way and because I don't go here and because I don't go there, I am holy. I possess holiness. Honey, you don't even know what the Word of God is saying. It says, follow after these things. Because until Jesus comes, you'll never possess them. You can dress every kind of way you want to dress. You can do every kind of thing you want to do. There is still room for growth. There is still room for advancement. There is still room for you to be complete. There is still room for you yet to become the perfect man. Hallelujah. Or woman. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.